Well, good morning. I'm grateful to be here. Grateful to see each and every one who's, who's been out here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you to the congregation here for, for hosting the study. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to brothers Ron and Richard, because being from the part of the, the country that I'm from, both of them have known me since I was a child, and they invited me anyway. <laughs> now, I appreciate Ron's comments at the beginning because uh, exactly what he said about the Septuagint is it really the focus of our study. Is that inspired men did quote from the Septuagint when they referred to the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we'd like to consider this, this phenomenon, consider what might have been their mentality and, and what uh, theoretical or conceptual considerations lie behind it as far as what a translation is and, and how a translation can and should be used. Um, and, and we'd really like to take this, this direction with our comments this morning. Now the topic of the Septuagint came to my attention for two reasons. First, it's because I've been researching the Old Testament canon for about two years now. The Septuagint, being a general term used to describe the Greek translations of the Old Testament, is a common theme in this field of study because several books that were not part of the Hebrew scriptures came to be associated with the Old Testament in Greek. This includes books like Tobit, Judith, 1st through 4th Maccabees, etc. Now it's important to understand the history of the Greek translation in order to understand how and why these books came to be considered part of the Word of God in the early Christian era. Now, we won't be focusing on this angle very much, but I give that part of the introduction because I do, I do have thoughts on that uh, side of things. And if anyone would like to hear more about that in the question and answer period, I do want to make myself available toward questions of canon and the Septuagint. Now, the second factor that led to my study of the Septuagint is a book that I came across by uh, Timothy Michael Law called When God Spoke Greek. In this book, Law makes the case that the Septuagint first is not so much a translation as it is a reimagining of the Old Testament. Second, he claims that Jesus and his apostles used the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew Old Testament. That is, this was their Bible, and they had no regard for the Hebrew original anymore. And third, he makes the claim that Christianity was founded on ideas that could not be discovered in the Old Testament. He believed the apostles misread the Old Testament. Now, I believe, of course, that all three claims that uh, he makes are false. But our presentation today will not be quite so much a, a direct refutation of these three points, that so we will interact with them throughout. <coughs> But I'd like to take a, a little bit more of a positive exploration through uh, what the Septuagint is and how the apostles used it uh, according to the biblical evidence. For this reason, we'll build our thoughts around three questions as we go through our study today. First, what is the Septuagint? Is it a translation of the Old Testament? Or does it represent a reimagined theology? that has little to do with the original intention of the prophets. Second, did the apostles use the Septuagint when they wrote the New Testament? And if so, how closely did they follow its interpretation of the Old Testament? And what impact did the Septuagint have on their ideas and their theology? And finally, uh, briefly, we'll, we'll consider what implications the apostolic use of a Bible translation have for us today as we use Bible translations to access the Word of God. To begin, it is helpful to uh, note that the term Septuagint can be somewhat misleading in the way that it's used in a lot of scholarship. The title is used generically to refer to a number of Greek translations of the books of the Old Testament, each of which was probably produced really by different translators at different times in the centuries before and after the life of Christ. As a result, we really shouldn't think about the Septuagint as a single homogenous translation, as it was not produced according to a consistent rubric and theory by representatives of a single interpretive tradition. Consequently, even though some copies of the ancient Christian Bible contain a more or less complete Old Testament in Greek, the individual books 
in each collection do not belong to a single translation in the modern sense. Most likely, the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, were the first ones translated uh, between 300 and 250 BC in Alexandria, Egypt. The rest of the Old Testament was probably produced uh, within about a century after this initial project. But there's no evidence that explains where or by whom this was done. Several minor revisions probably took place during this time and before the early Christian era, although it does not seem that any one revision encompassed the entirety of the Old Testament. Rather, individual scribes seem to have chosen individual books of the Old Testament to edit as they copied them and as they used them. And it was not until after Christianity was firmly established that the whole collection would be revised systematically to create a whole that could be called the Septuagint. At the same time, after Jesus and the apostles had finished their revelatory work in the, the New Testament, at least three competing translations were produced uh, from the Jewish, uh, from the rabbinic Jewish school of thought. Um, it is also possible that there were several other translations of a, a part or all of the Hebrew scriptures. Archaeologists have located several fragments among the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, that do not uh, quite match any of the known translations. Consequently, it's difficult to say whether there even was such a thing as a standardized Greek translation on the, on the whole of the Old Testament during Jesus' lifetime. And even if such a standardized text did exist, it has not yet been possible to reconstruct it from the fragments that are left for us today. Thus, we simply cannot know exactly what the Greek translations looked like when Christianity was established. We can have a reasonably good idea for most of the Old Testament, but there remains quite a bit of uncertainty, especially when major variations exist from passage to passage. Written history does not help us much either. Let's see. I missed one here. Okay. Written history does not help us much either. No first-hand account of the translation process remains today. The closest record that we do have is commonly called the Letter of Aristeus. This was allegedly written by a man named Aristeus to his brother Philocrates, and the, the author claimed to have been an eyewitness to the translation process. According to the letter, Demetrius, the librarian of Alexandria at the time, sent a letter to the high priest in Jerusalem to request a copy of the Law of Moses to be stored in the, the Library of Alexandria. Additionally, Demetrius asked that the high priest would send a translation com committee who would be able to produce a good quality copy of the Pentateuch in Greek. 72 envoys, uh, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, were sent with a copy of the law from Jerusalem. And according to the, the report in the letter of Aristeus, they produced a full translation of all five books of Moses in just 72 days. At the end of the letter, the author pronounced a curse upon all who would dare to change the text of the translation in any way. There's good reason to believe that this letter was not written until about 100 years after the translation was first produced. This was still about 200 years before Jesus was born. And it reads like a piece of propaganda. Perhaps some other Greek translation had been produced by this point in time. Or perhaps there was a faction in Judaism that resisted the idea that God could be sincerely worshipped in a language other than Hebrew. Whatever the case may be, the letter strongly implies that God inspired the translation process in order to give his sanction to those who used the Old Testament in Greek. Now, in the estimation of the Apostle Peter, representing a sober uh, <coughs> Uh, representing a sober view of the inspiration of God, according to 2 Peter 1, 20, 20 and 21, it was necessary to prove that a document had been inspired by God before it could, could be considered authoritative. The letter of Aristeus evidently prompted many Hellenistic Jews and representatives of the early church to develop a preference for the Septuagint because they believed the letter's claims of inspiration. They believed that God had sanctioned the Septuagint as a replacement for the Hebrew scriptures. But there is simply no evidence that God really inspired the process. 
The letter of Aristeus did not appear until a hundred years after the events in question, and it was not directly connected to the translators. The translation of the Old Testament into the Greek language was the product of human initiative and human effort. However, its existence did serve a purpose, and it served the writers of the New Testament and subsequent generations of Christians in their evangelistic efforts. Hebrew was a relatively minor language in the world at the time, but when the gospel was extended to all nations, the contents of the Hebrew scriptures became a matter of concern for all nations. The fact that, they had all, uh, the fact that these scriptures had already been translated into Greek made the early Christians' job easier in many ways. But the fact of the translation did make some things more difficult. The fact that it was a translation made some things more difficult. And this is what we will explore presently. Jesus was born into a world that already knew the Old Testament scriptures in two languages, the Hebrew originals and the Greek translations. Did these two versions agree in their content and their scope? Were the Greek versions simply a translation of the Hebrew original, or do they represent a more creative interpretation of the message of the Old Testament? Now, here we'll return to Timothy Michael Law and see his take on this question. He says, we will soon encounter some remarkable differences between the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. This should be stated very clearly right away since the Septuagint translation is sometimes misjudged as merely a translation when it is more than that. In many places, the messages contained in the Septuagint are different from what we have in the Hebrew Bible, a significance whose weight will be forced upon us when we see how New Testament authors and early Christian writers constructed their theological visions on the basis of the Septuagint. This is his view. And he pointed to several different types of, of disagreements, at least, in his view, that supported his conclusion. So let's look at each of those types in order. First, certain passages in the Greek translations show signs of harmonization and clarification to resolve difficulties in the text. For example, in the Hebrew text, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2 reports that God finished his work on the seventh day of creation. Now, when it was translated into Greek, they changed it to say that he finished his work on the sixth day to avoid any sort of implication that God violated his own Sabbath. Likewise, Genesis 4 and 7 in the Hebrew text offers the principle, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. This is 1995 New American Standard Bible. The Greek translation, on the other hand, takes this as a direct reference to Cain's sin, uh, the nature of which is a matter of interpretation in the Hebrew text. So the Hebrew text leaves it ambiguous exactly what Cain did wrong, although we can find implications in the text. But the Septuagint makes it explicit. According to the New English translation of the Septuagint, this verse says, if you offer correctly, but do not divide correctly, have you not sinned? The second kind of difference that we can find between the Hebrew text and the Greek text is that some verses and chapters appear in a different order in the Greek translations than in the Hebrew text. This ranges from the movement of a single verse, as in Numbers 10, where verse 34 in the Hebrew text, which uh, underlies our, our current English Bibles, appears after verse 36 in the Greek translation. Sometimes these kinds of changes can encompass a whole chapter, so that in 1 Kings, chapters 20 and 21 are reversed in order. In Ezekiel, one manuscript in Greek, though not all, places chapter 37 after chapters 38 and 39, so it's moved two places. Third, in several places, the Greek translation offers a passage or an entire book in a significantly shorter form with less detail than its equivalent passage in the Hebrew text. This is true of Exodus 36 to 37, 1 Samuel 17 and 18, and several passages in the book of Jeremiah. Fourth, in numerous places, the Greek translations of the Old Testament are significantly larger than the equivalent passage in the Hebrew text. This is probably most noticeable in the book of Esther, 
where numerous prophecies and prayers, among other supplements, were added to the content found in the Hebrew text. Other additions include a 151st Psalm in the Greek translations, three additional narratives in the book of Daniel, and further, many Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament include entire books and letters that claim a close affinity with the text of the Hebrew Bible, but have never been found in Hebrew themselves. These include books like First and Second Esdras, which expand on the events of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, a book called The Prayer of Manasseh, which claims to be a prayer that's mentioned in Second Chronicles 33.19, and the book of Baruch and the letter of Jeremiah, which both claim to build on the work of Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch. And finally, uh, copies of the Greek Old Testament include several books that were never a part of the Hebrew tradition. These books were either written in Greek or in uh, Hebrew, or, or the Hebrew and Aramaic originals have been lost to time. These entire books that don't, don't have a close affinity to any existing Hebrew book include Judith, Tobit, 1st through 4th Maccabees, the Wisdom of Solomon, and the Wisdom of Ben Sirach, or uh, Ecclesiasticus, as it's also known. When we take all of these differences together, it does seem that the Greek versions of the Old Testament are more than simply a literal translation of the original text. However, this view assumes that the Greek translations were the, the product of a unified effort. Law assumes that the Septuagint followed a consistent line of thought that, that produced all of these changes to serve a particular purpose. It is true that many of the Greek translations differ from the Hebrew text for a variety of reasons, but it is also true that some books outside of the Hebrew canon or it is also true that some books outside the Hebrew canon were treated as scripture by many early Christians, leading to their inclusion in biblical manuscripts in the fourth century AD. But these facts do not lead to the conclusion that all, or even most, Jews and Christians who accessed the Old Testament through these translations accepted these differences as an authoritative replacement for the Hebrew text. There were differences, there were difficulties, and problems that they had to overcome when they used the Greek translations, but there's no evidence that they just took these things in stride and let them influence their decision making, at least not early on. To support this observation, we need to notice, first of all, that the Greek translations of the Hebrew scriptures are, above all else, translations. Their significance to the faith and the practice of Hellenistic Jews, that is Jews who could only speak Greek and could not speak Hebrew, as well as early Christians who did not know Hebrew, was based on the fact that they took the word of God in Hebrew and transferred it into the Greek language so that they could understand it. The translations were not themselves the word of God, but as far as they accurately communicated the meaning of the Hebrew text written by the inspired prophets of old, then they became faithful representations of the word of God in Greek, as far as they were accurate. This distinction makes it possible for us to differentiate between accurate and inaccurate translations from passage to passage within the Greek versions. This is not meant to insult the integrity of these translations or of their purpose and methods, but it rather recognizes that they were fallible humans who could make mistakes. The same considerations can and should be applied to translations of both the Hebrew and Greek Bible throughout human history, in every language, including our modern English translations. But to understand this, we have to ask the question, what is an accurate translation? And what is an inaccurate translation? To answer these, we have to first consider a much more fundamental concept. What is translation in the first place? What does it actually mean to translate something from one language to another. Well, translation first requires a source text with a real and fixed meaning. This ultimately serves as the standard by which the accuracy of the translation will be determined. Now, we will already find some challenges here when studying the Septuagint. It is likely that certain parts were translated from a Hebrew text that did not belong to the Masoretic tradition used in modern Bible translations. Uh, a few 
Hebrew manuscripts have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, that contain some of these variants, some of these differences that we just described as far as length of content and detail of content. Uh, and it's possible that the Greek translations came, you know, were translated from some of these different Hebrew manuscripts. But most of the variants, most of the differences can be traced to either the translator's style or sometimes, even often, his inability to understand what the Hebrew was actually saying. Consequently, while it is likely that some of the translators worked from a Hebrew text that differed from a, a minor differences to significant differences from the Masoretic text that we use today, these differences had a relatively small impact on the content of the translation. The Septuagint is, by and large, a translation of the same Hebrew text that we use in our modern translations today. So where could all of these variations come from if the, the Hebrew text was the same? The answer lies in the translation process itself. Translation is and must be an interpretive process. Uh, Karen Jobes and Moise Silva in their book, Invitation to the Septuagint, offer the following explanation regarding the complexity of meaning in, in uh, relation to the Septuagint. And forgive me for the long quote, this will take up three slides, but we'll uh, work through it because what they say is worth hearing. A given word in any language has a range of meaning, sometimes narrow, sometimes quite broad. The specific meaning of the word in a sentence is determined by the context. For instance, the English word play can be a verb, as in children play, or I play the piano. Two examples illustrating that even as a verb, play has a, a broad range of meaning. As a noun, moreover, the word can refer to several events, a stage performance, as in I saw a play, or an athletic feat, as in he made the play that won the game. Every word in any language also shares a semantic field or a domain with other words to which it is related in meaning. For instance, as a noun, play shares a semantic domain with words that also refer to visual objects of recreation, such as movie, performance, and stage show. Not only may a given word have two or more different senses, but each of these senses may also belong to a different semantic domain. Therefore, a translator must be able to identify the context of a statement well enough to understand the sense of a given word correctly <coughs> and not to confuse it with a different sense belonging to another semantic domain. A second level of interpretation is the task of finding adequate equivalence in the target language. To complicate matters, the semantic range of a given word is usually not identical to the range of its corresponding word in another language. This affords the opportunity for interpretation, and thus for error. When someone translates a word from one language to, into another, he or she must decide what sense the original word carries and identify a word with similar meaning in the target language. Thus, even if the sense of the original thought has been correctly understood, a word in the target language may be chosen that has a more specific or more general meaning than the original word. Moreover, the translator may tend to choose in the target language one word instead of another for various reasons, such as to make the translation sound pleasant or to avoid suggesting a social, political, or religious taboo in the target culture. Now, based on this information, we can recognize that an effective translator must first understand what the original says. Second, he must find, if possible, an equivalent expression in the target language that communicates the same nuanced meaning or the closest approximation possible in the same context. The second step is not always possible even for the most capable of translators because the original expression may hold a degree of ambiguity that cannot be reproduced in the target language, resulting in a translation that must be more specific than the original text. Or, in other cases, the original may have a degree of specificity that cannot be re uh, replicated in the target language, resulting in a translation that is more ambiguous 
than the original text. Likewise, if the translator fails to accurately understand the original expression, he cannot in any case produce an accurate uh, translation. I missed that slide. All of these factors can be seen in the Greek translations of the Old Testament. It is difficult, if not impossible, to identify a unifying translation theory between the books of the Greek Old Testament, since the translators of the individual books cannot be identified. However, Jobes and Silva have pointed out several indications that the translators have been affected by, one, the theological beliefs of the translators. For example, some of the translators demonstrate an aversion to using anthropomorphic language or analogical language to refer to God. So they, they would re retranslate or reinterpret passages that refer to the hand of God, for example, to talk about the power of God, to try to remove this kind of language from the scriptures. Second, they could also be uh, affected by the exegetical traditions or the interpretive traditions that informed the translator's understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. For example, the translators of Genesis, as we noted earlier, modified the language of Genesis 2-2 to make sure that their readers understood that God's work ended on the sixth day, not the seventh day, to stress that no work could be done on the Sabbath. And third, the translators could also be influenced by the socio-political situation in which each translation was produced. So some of the prophets, for example, were translated when they would refer to a Canaanite deity, the names were changed to refer to a Greek deity that was worshiped in Alexandria so that the text was more immediately applicable to the Hellenistic Jews situation. So the fact that the translators were actively interpreting the original Hebrew text while they translated provides an avenue for the introduction of error. If the translator of a particular passage misunderstood the meaning of that passage, his translation would reflect his misunderstanding. Conversely, the interpretive process could bring more specificity into a passage that was somewhat ambiguous in the Hebrew, but if the specificity matches the original meaning, that is, if the translator took special care to make sure that he understood what the original text meant in its context, then the translation can reflect a sound interpretation, even if it appears to contain more detail than what was originally present. We, uh, I'll point out two examples here. One that will be a little bit easier because it's coming from Greek into English, so we can see how it works in our own language. And this is one that many of us are probably already familiar with. The Greek word angelos can be translated both as an angel or a messenger. Now, using the terms that Jobes and Silva used a few moments ago, this means that the word angelos has a semantic domain, a range of meaning that includes anything from uh, a newspaper boy all the way up to a, an extremely powerful heavenly being sent to do God's will. Now we don't have a word that covers that same range of meaning in English. We've borrowed this word for the, the far side of that, that meaning, the, the heavenly messenger sense. So we have a word angel that overlaps in meaning with the word angelos, but it doesn't share the same semantic field precisely. At the same time, we have another word that's useful for other times that this word is used in the New Testament, messenger. So whenever a translator comes across this word angelos, he has to decide which part of that semantic field is being used in, in that particular passage, and then choose an English translation that will properly reflect that. It would not be proper in English to say that John the Baptist was an angel of God, even though he's called an angelos at multiple places in the New Testament. This comes up uh, in particular in certain passages like Revelation 2.1, when Christ addressed a letter to the angel of the churches of Asia, or to the angels of the churches of Asia throughout Revelation 2 and 3. And how we interpret those passages will affect whether we think that angel or messenger is a better translation in those places. Now, this serves to, uh, to illustrate an example 
of one of those changes that Timothy Michael Law claimed influenced the theology of the New Testament. We can look at a, a particular word in Isaiah 7.14, which is an oft-discussed prophecy applied to Jesus in the New Testament. In this passage, Isaiah predicted that a virgin will be with child and bear a son. Now this word, this Hebrew word is, if I can pronounce it right, Alma or something like that. The, the guttural is a little difficult for me, but it's, it's, we usually say Alma. And this may refer to, uh, generically to a young woman, whether she was married or unmarried, or it might refer more specifically to a virgin. The old Greek translations chose to represent this word with the Greek word parthenos, which has that very specific meaning of virgin. This translation is not unfaithful to the original text, but one could also imagine that someone could use another word like neonis, uh, which simply means young woman in Greek. So this translation is not unfaithful to the original text, even though it is more specific, that the, the translators of the Septuagint use this word for virgin, parthenos, in this passage, making the meaning more specific than the original. The translator believed, perhaps based on the context of the passage and his interpretation of other and related texts, that the word parthenos would best explain the prophet's intended meaning, even if that would exclude other meanings that someone could imagine existing in this passage. That the translator was correct in this passage is supported, of course, by the inspired testimony in Matthew 123, but the Greek translations are filled with interpretive decisions like this. Some are certainly accurate to God's original message through his prophets, but others may miss the mark to varying degrees. So we can see that even when the Septuagint was a little bit more interpretive in how it translated, in fact, it really needed to be more interpretive in many places, then it often still reflected the accurate word of God according to the Hebrew scriptures. However, the simple fact that many or even most of the translator's interpretations accurately reflected the sense of the Hebrew cannot prove that all of the interpretations are equally accurate. Because the translation process was fragmented and because the translators were fallible human beings, each interpretation has to be assessed individually. And the only standard that can be consistently used for this assessment is the Hebrew Bible itself. So that means those in the early church who are capable of looking back at the Hebrew could make a sound judgment on whether a Greek passage accurately reflected the original meaning or if it veered off to one direction or another. Now this brings us to the, the central question of our presentation. Was the Septuagint the Bible of the Apostles? Timothy Michael Law makes the claim that the Septuagint drove the theology of the Apostles and that they were students of its interpretations. But did it have this kind of control over their interpretive work in the Old Testament? Law claims that the Old Greek versions are the only possible source for several significant theological concepts developed at length in the New Testament, such as the vocabulary used to refer to covenants or testaments, the gospel, the virgin birth, the title Christ, was used in the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew Messiah, and the title Lord, as it was used for both God and Jesus, was based, it seems, on Septuagint usage, or at least it, it reflected the same interpretive tradition that the Septuagint followed. Law argues that the New Testament authors could not have found these words and ideas themselves, and they could not have found them in the Hebrew scriptures if the Greek translators had not already done so. But to, to develop a framework for us to understand these claims, it's helpful to view a few facts. First, the apostles began their work in a world where the entire body of the Old Testament literature had already been translated into Greek. The term evangelion, for example, had been used, to, used accurately to translate the term good news or glad tidings in passages like Isaiah 49, Isaiah 52 and 7, uh, chapter 60 verse 6 and 61 verse 1. Consequently, Whenever Greek-speaking Jews, before Jesus' birth, talked about the glad tidings of God's messianic rule, as it was prophesied in Isaiah, they used the word evangelion. The apostles saw no problem with this word. In fact, it's rather a well-suited word 
to express the idea that Isaiah discussed in Hebrew, so the New Testament writings continued to use it. There was no problem with it. Second, the fact that the Greek translators used these terms in the first place was not a new discovery or a new invention on their part. Rather, these words were simply an accurate expression and interpretation of the ideas found in the Hebrew Bible in a way understandable to those who did not speak Hebrew. Every one of these ideas can be found in the Hebrew Bible, just not with Greek words because it's written in Hebrew. And third, since this terminology was based on the Hebrew scriptures themselves, the apostles' perpetuation of it, or their use of this terminology, does not mean that they learned about these concepts through the Greek translations. Instead, their goal was to announce the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament to all, including those who did not know Hebrew. The terminology of the Greek translations, which had proven to be accurate, served to be the best tool for the job. In essence, it Law is kind of blaming, Timothy Michael Law is kind of blaming the apostles for not reinventing the wheel when the wheel had already been in use for a few hundred years before they came around. Consequently, it seems likely that the apostles used the Greek versions throughout their writings. But to say that their theology was shaped exclusively by the Septuagint is a bit of an overreach. A strong case can be made that the New Testament authors understood the nuance and context of every Old Testament passage that they quote. Although such a case would necessarily demand that we, we study every single reference to the Old Testament in the New Testament, which we, we don't have uh, time to do. But it is sufficient to note that the apostles did use the Greek versions. But there is no evidence that these versions represented the final authority to the apostles, nor that they never appealed to the original Hebrew in, uh, in lieu of the Greek translations. Instead, their use of the Greek Old Testament might be equivalent to how we use English translations to communicate with English speakers today. It may be helpful to look at an example of how the Apostle Paul used the Old Testament in Greek. It is clear that he was familiar with the translations as they existed, but he did not feel bound to follow them as an authoritative document, especially since he himself spoke both Hebrew and Greek, and so he could comment intelligently on whether or not the translators had missed the mark. So we'll look at two examples in 1 Corinthians, both quoting from the book of Isaiah, both very close together in the book. In one example, Paul used the Septuagint, and in another, he didn't. So the first example is in 1 Corinthians 1.19, where he quotes from Isaiah 29.14. I have it up here in uh, really the same text in three different versions. The, the text of 1 Corinthians 1.19 and the 1995 text of the New American Standard Bible, as well as Isaiah 29.14 on the bottom in the same translation. And then in the middle, I have Isaiah 29.14 in the New English translation of the Septuagint, the Nets version. So this text is, is, has minor variations between the three, but I'll uh, comment on it once we read them. So first, 1 Corinthians 1.19 in the NASB. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Isaiah 29, 14 in the, the New English translation of the Septuagint says, I will remove them and destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will hide. But then the New American Standard Bible's representation of the Hebrew text is slightly different. And the wisdom of their wise men will perish and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Now, the Greek text that Paul uses, it's muddled a little bit by the fact that we're reading a translation of a translation in both of these cases, but the text that Paul quotes in Greek is almost identical to the Septuagint text. Only one word is different. But both show the same interpretive level or interpretive work from the Hebrew text, at least in one respect. Note that the Hebrew text at the, uh, the bottom there, states its content passively. That is, wisdom will perish. Discernment will be concealed. The actor is not mentioned in the Hebrew text. But the quote in 1 Corinthians 1.19 and the Septuagint both translate this actively. I, God, will destroy wisdom, and I will set aside cleverness. 
This shows us two things. First, that the Greek translator changed the grammar of the sentence slightly to make it clearer in Greek. That is, he applied a layer of interpretation to make sure that the original force of the passage was preserved and clearly understood in Greek. And in doing so, he remained faithful to the meaning of the Hebrew text. And second, when Paul quoted the passage, he saw this layer of interpretation and he agreed with it. Therefore, he saw it as a faithful representation of what Isaiah had said, and he left it the way it was. He simply used the translation as it existed. By contrast, just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, Paul quoted an, another passage from Isaiah 64.4 in a way that did not agree with the Septuagint at all. Uh, we have the same layout here as far as the translations are concerned. The New American Standard Bible says, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. The Septuagint there says, from ages past we have not heard nor have our eyes seen any God beside you and your works, which you will do to those who wait for mercy. And finally, the Hebrew text agrees more closely with the Septuagint here. From days of old, they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. Now, this passage is fascinating, and uh, it's an interesting study in several ways, but for our purposes, it illustrates the fact that Paul was not dependent on the Septuagint to transfer the meaning of the Hebrew text into Greek. In fact, the, uh, Paul seems to have written his own translation in this case. Now, something that's uh, even more interesting in this case is that Paul and the other apostles seem to have taught the same mentality to early Christians. There isn't a lot of evidence for how the earliest Christians used the Old Testament until about a hundred years after the end of the Apostolic Age, but one letter in particular proves, uh, provides quite a few citations, including one from Isaiah 64.4. This is the letter of First Clement. Clement almost always quoted from the Septuagint verbatim. It seems he did not know Hebrew at all. So he was forced to rely on the Greek translation of the Old Testament to understand it in the first place. But when he quoted from Isaiah 64.4, he quoted Paul's translation, not the Septuagint. So it's fascinating that the apostles not only didn't feel bound by the interpretive uh, work that the, the Septuagint translators had done, but they taught the earliest Christians to have the same attitude. The Hebrew text was where the authority lay, not the Greek text. Now to end very briefly, uh, what does this mean for us today? How can we use these lessons on how the apostles used translations and how they taught others to view them? First and foremost, we can use modern translations more rationally and effectively. The apostles found it uh, helpful to use the translations available in their day to express the message of the word of God, but they were conscious of the fact that the message of the translations was guided by the uh, translator's interpretive abilities. It is not always or even often possible to translate a sentence from one language into another completely literally without losing some of the meaning. This means that the translator's ability to accurately understand the passage in its original language will shape the way that he expresses it in Greek or in any other language. The way the apostles expressed the meaning of the Old Testament in Greek shows that they were acutely aware of this fact. Some of their interpretation of the Old Testament lined up with the translators of the Septuagint, but sometimes it did not. In every case, it was the original text that decided what the real meaning was. Not many of us have direct access to the original languages of the Bible, but we can be aware consciously that every translation, even the most literal translations, represent some level of interpretation. The translations we use are not inspired, and they will stand or fall, sometimes in the space of a single passage, depending on how well the translators understood the original text. We can use this knowledge practically, summing up very, very, uh, at the very end here, but we can use this knowledge very practically even if we don't know Greek or Hebrew, by taking advantage of the different interpretations that are available in different translations. I'll put up a slide that we can talk about a little bit more, but this is, if it's big enough to see, <laughs> but this is, this is 1 Peter 3.21 in six translations, 
which represent generally three interpretations on what the word answer in the New King James, appeal in the ESV, and pledge in the NIV means. There are three different interpretations, broadly speaking, and we can take advantage of these different interpretations to help us understand what the original text meant, or at least what degree of ambiguity, ambiguity exists. I'll uh, conclude there and open up for questions.